Yes, yes, yes. Shalom, Chavarim. Shalom, shalom. They pull us into Kemet, right? <laughs> Egypt. But here, of course, here in the season, the Pesach, Fasika coming forward here in the season. Here we're in the second book of Moshe, the Hebrew book that is known as Exodus in the KJV or the Sefer Shemot, Yetziat, Yetziat, the coming out, the Exodus, Yetziat, to Mimitzrayim from Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim. So Hebraically refer to ancient um, Egypt, a.k.a. synonymously known as Kemet. Why is it pseudo? Is, is Kemet in a sense pseudo? Is Kemet pseudo? This is the question we're asking. So what was the original name? We hear, oh, the ancient land was called Kemet, right? Is that correct? Now we know that the people, you know, Remet and Kemet, Remet and Kemet, they call themselves, you know, Romet, Romet, some debate how the Metunet uh, was pronounced, but the Romet in Kemet or the Remet in Kemet, they were the people of the what? The black land, that black land, right? So the land, now how does land get black? First of all, did they ever tell you that? Uh, many of our fellow, you could say pro-black, yeah, we are pro-black righteousness, right? Pro-black righteousness, you know, but death to black and white down presses, you know, as I and I Rastafari, Rastafari, Yehudim. So right here, 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 we know that that land came down from Tobia, from Ethiopia for the inundation of the Nile, right? But without that rich black, we could say silt and all of that topsoil that was rich in nutrients where the people of um, the Romet and Kemet or the Remet and Kemet, the people of the black land, but would not be a black land if it wasn't for Ethiopia, the land of Kush or the Kui land, the Tanet land, the Tanet land, right? The land of the gods, as they call it, the Kush land, the Kui land, the Tob, and the ancient archaic. Most of them can't touch this out there in the so called pseudo black continent because they're not really studying the linguistics. The linguistics is very, very important. And here, we of the Royal Order of Ethiopian Hebrews after the Order of Melchizedek have something to share right here, right? And doesn't this miss? Yes, the land was called Kemet, but only in the later, in the later, the later days, the later history. So that means that many of our pro-black scholars are not really going to the root or they haven't been studying as diligently as they should. Now, we're not talking about the grandfathers and the grandmothers of scholarship so much so right here, the Dr. Benz, the Sheikh Anta Diops, the rest of them, because many of their research for what they had available in their time, you know, is quite excellent, you know, on certain specific areas, right? But here, 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 let's just show this right here. So the question is, what was Kemet, my originally called? <laughs> We even saw on some of the questions, we did a little kind of, um, you know, quick uh, Google just now before we started again, because some of our notes are here and there. But this question, this point kind of comes up again and again and again and again. So the real connection, the root of ancient so-called Kemet or Egypt, if we're talking about the black land, that's because of Ethiopia. Think about it for a moment. They would not have that land if that land was not gifted or given from Tobia, from Ethiopia, the ancient Egyptians, so-called, right, as it's called in the English, the ancient Egyptians, they knew that their root was this god land, this, this region over here, right, the, the Sheba, right, the Sheba, the Horn of Africa, the Tobia, you know, the Ben Yamin, Yemen, Ben Yemen, Benjamin, Ben, you know, this Judah land, in the south, right? But here, looking at ancient Egypt, what was this original name? Now, most would swear up and down. And that's because they have been taught. And what would they have been taught? Here we have one of the rivers. You see how the rivers, some of the ancient rivers and even the modern rivers right there in the blue right there, the Kush land, Havila land, right? Now over here, the Kush land, because it was Kush, right? Kush, right? There was Kush in the east and Kush in the west. I'm talking about when you're over there in the east. That's a related point there, the so-called Fertile Crescent, right? But what they leave out is Elam and ancient India, right? Some people say the Hindus Kush. Even that there is kind of pseudo. We're going to touch on that. You can see how the Kushite peoples on both sides, and that's even according to the scriptural reference, the biblical, the Hebrew scriptural reference. Now, in the Hebrew scriptures, we refer to ancient Egypt as Mitzrayim, right? As Mizraim. 
right? You know, the Mizraim. Let's just bring that up right here. We hope this to be a short, direct to this particular point right here. What was ancient Egypt called? Right? What was ancient right Egypt called? Right? Let's go here. Let's put let's put Kush here. Let's put Kush here. Right? Oh, sleek uh Miss Typo right there. Kush. Okay, so here we okay, we're actually in the strong's light. Let's come out of that right there. Let's come out of that and go back to the Bible search right here. Let's put Kush back in there. This is an interlinear type of software that really helps us do some of the best and the blessed research right here. So here you see right there in Genesis 10 and 6, you'll see where it has um, Mizraim. Now Mizraim actually in the proper Hebrew would be Mitzraim. Mitzraim. Right, you see Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim. Now you see the BDB Brown Drivers Briggs says the BDB definition is Egypt here, Mitzrayim in the sense of the H forty seven fourteen. Right, refers to the double. I want you to keep keep point on that. Right, double straights. Right, because of the Hebrew the Hebrew context. Right, the double borders, double straights. You know, a country at the northeastern section of Africa. So for all people say that Egypt, Egypt in the ancient times was not in Africa because Africa was Libya. Boom. Period. Let them pick up on that. They're going to tell you that, but they're not going to tell you where they got that from. Right. We've been doing the research and there's even more there that can illuminate and enlighten us. But people are not even honorable and respectful to say, yeah, it was Rastafari Jews, Rasai Adonis Yad in there that broke that down because ancient Egypt Right, or Mitzrayim, or what you want to call Kemet or Egyptos, Egyptos later from the Het Kapata, from the name of Memphis, Het Kapata, Egypta, right, the Gibbets, right, was located outside of Africa because Africa was what on the map today is Libya and Tunisia. Just check that right there. So, one time Egypt was not in Africa. Because remember, this is foreigners naming the continent, so forth and so on, and other things. Now, we're not saying that the term Africa cannot be traced to our linguistics, but we know from the history, it was the Romans, right, who had located the uh, um, Carthage, the new city, and, and, and Libya, that Libya region, and they're the ones who had called that region Africa. Africa was, was Libya and Tunisia. All the rest... Right, was called Ethiopia, right, Ethiopus, right, and parts of it's called Libya, right. But the area that we call today Libya was actually Africa. So at one time, Africa or Egypt was not in Africa, what's called Egypt was not in Africa because of the naming of it. So we have to really take heed to this right here and not try to sidestep it. Even this whole Kemet thing right here is pseudo. Why it's pseudo? Because it doesn't point to the origins, the root. It goes from the 11th dynasty and forward. We're going to bring that forward as well. A country at the northeastern section of Africa adjacent to Palestine and through which the Nile flows. And the Nile, we know, comes from that root in the Horn of Africa or the Horn of Tobia, right, with Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, um, um, Tanzania, um, and I hope I'm not missing any country. Right up there, we showed on the map. But that's where it comes from. That's and even the, some of the roots also connect further south, right? The inhabitants are, are natives of Egypt, who in the later period of ancient Egypt called themselves the Romet in Kremet or the Remech. Some say the Remech, Romet, because there's a dispute about how the letters were interpreted and how it should be pronounced. But the Romet, Remech in Kremet, right? They were the people. Right, the men, the people, or the natives of the of the Kemet land. Right, and that Kemet ground, right, was not all of ancient Egypt. All of ancient Egypt was not that ground. See, this is why people need to really do this research, and we're trying to provide this to the Black Conscious community. Right, and the, like the Jabaris. Well, the Jabaris and the rest of them should know this because ones like Dr. Reggie, you know, actually brought this forward. So hail up to Dr. Reggie. He brought this forward, right? And I think also other ones like even Garfield, right? Hail up to Garfield, you know, on these points right here. He brought that forward as well. Some of you might know who we're speaking about, but here we're going to speak about some stuff that they haven't spoken about, right? Because this requires a linguistic science, right? The science of our ancient linguistics. Strong's definition, it's the dual 
right, of the H4693. So the H4714 is the dual, the dual, right, of this right here, right? Matsor, Matsor. What's a Matsor? Matsor. Matsor is also a name of Egypt. Another way of bringing this out in the Hebrew is a siege or entrenchment. But you can see where it says the origin, the same as the H4692, right? Matsor, Matsor. Matsor, Matsor. Right, which means a, a siege, enclosure, entrenchment, siege works. Now we have to understand the whole life of ancient Egypt had to do with the rivers, the river, the Nile, and regulating the flow of that. So there were dams, the ancient dams and entrenchments that were done. Right. So here we find the Hebrew which is an Afro-Shemitic, it's an African, the Hebrews, the Israelites, the African culture, what you call today and what we call today African culture, right? Using today's um, academic standards. So it's the African culture. In fact, Hebrew is an Afro-Shemitic language. Afro, get it? Afro. So the name for Egypt, siege, entrenchment, proper locative name, you know what it says? In the sense of a limit, right? A limit. Egypt, as the border of Palestine in this besieged place of defense fortified, but comes from the sense of a limit, right? As one's in studying ancient, you know, upper and lower Egypt and the back and forth, historically speaking, so forth and so on. So we say Mitzrayi, right? And we are even reminding ourselves and our Havarim fellows to also utilize this point of reference. Because even in many of the Alio, some of the Alios we recorded from previous, we'll say Egypt or Mitzrayim, and sometimes we'll say Kemet. But that's not always applicable, right? Now, in the terms of when the Hebrews were in ancient Mitzrayim, yes, that could be applicable, but we'll go into some more work on that. But what was the ancient name? What was the ancient name? This is just more or less to put this into context. What was the ancient name? So, Hebraically, we say Mizrayim. My, this right here, Mitz, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, Mizrayim. The, the two sieges, the two borders referring to upper and lower. But guess what, brothers and sisters? My, this is what the ancient, quote, Egyptians, end quote, what they called it themselves too. How come the black scholars are not going there with it? But sometimes we get too caught up on trying to like outdo the white man or the white man say this. And, you know, it, it's like we still are like minstreling for the white man instead of really trying to educate ourselves and our fellow. Well, oh, what would the white man say? Oh, the white man, da, da, da. stop that. Whatever, whatever is good, we take it, we work with it. Whatever is not, we leave it alone. Here you can see that the Kushite peoples are on both sides because that means Arabia, what's called Arabia, Ethiopia, right, or Afro-Arabia was a part of what we call the continent of Africa, anciently known as Ethiopia. And the peoples, the Kushite peoples, were on both sides, even further, even further eastward. But this is a good point of reference map right here you can see some speculate whether this was the Ophir you see how this is broken up with the mountains and the rivers see how the rivers right there the blue lines all those rivers so all those rivers lead down you see the river now right there lead down into what is Egypt and the Delta right there right and the ancients built siege works encampments embankments and other kind of of structures in order to regulate the waters Right, regulate the waters so that that rich topsoil that was coming down the Nile, something we use this as a point of reference here. Right, so that black land, that black ground actually came from somewhere else. It came from the land of the gods, the Kui land, the Taneta land, right? Namely, the Horn of Africa and Arabia. We find from our research both the Horn of Africa and Arabia, right? Then this also connects with the ancient. Queen of Sheba, King Solomon, another important part of our heritage connection, right? But here is an example of the ground. So there was the red grounds, right? And then there was the red grounds were like more like the desert, right? They use the term Darshet to refer to like to the desert, right? And that was more on the western side. But the eastern side, right? The eastern side, east side, right? The eastern side was where they farmed, 
right? The eastern side of the Nile. So in other words, we look at the map again, right? And the eastern side on most maps will be the right-hand side. And the western side is where the deserts were, where they used to bury their dead. So the whole land of ancient Mitzrayim, right, was not called Kemet or the Adama. See, when you say Kemet in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew scriptures, we refer to this as the Adama, right, as what's known as the Adama, the Adama, the Adama from Adam, right, that rich reddish brown ground, right. See, even the terms we call colors red, and we're thinking of red. When we say red, we think of the red in the Western Gentile European mindset. And we forget how we saw colors and how we determine the naming of these things. So we're going according to a lot of European standards, not checking our Afro-Semitic speakers even today and checking out the linguistics today. Right? Here, here, here is another example from higher up the Tob, Tobia. So this ground will come from Ethiopia region, the inundation. Right, the silt, right? So it was also called the Kemet, right? Or that dark land. You can see the Rastafari Israelites starting soon, soon, soon. Check it, check it, check it. A couple more minutes here. We'll get into some more detail on this. Herodotus even spoke about the gifts of the Nile. The gifts from where? From Tobia, from Ethiopia, where most of your pro black scholars, some of them admittedly say they don't know much, they don't know nothing about it. I mean, that's a shame right there. It's a shame that a lot of the pro-black comedic scholars are limiting their research, right, to some things in some ways from our even older scholars, which are somewhat, somewhat, how can we say, somewhat dated, right, somewhat dated. And there's some nuances that we really need to get into, right? It's important, some of the nuances that we need to get into, some of the nuances of the research. This really will add more clarity, right? Adding more clarity to our research and context, right, to it, right? So ones are going on a lot of old research, which was good in its time, right? Which was good and relevant in its time, but has been, in that sense, superseded on some levels, right, by more better research, right, by more better research that is not being included because many of our scholars are being lazy, right? Uh, so, sometimes even haters too. Those of us who have the linguistic capacity, they're not checking, right? And therefore, even where they could be getting with even their comedic scholarship, you know, we're all about the Royal Order of Ethiopian Hebrews, but ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet is... Or as they, as it's called, right? Because we're not revealing well what's what is the name just yet. We're not revealing what the name is just yet because we want to find out what do your scholars know, right? Since they want to deride, you know, the Ethiopian Hebrew roots, right? And what we already told them that if you want to really, right, put your scholarship on the proverbial steroids and get some things clarified. Because there's a lot of things that are not clarified. And sometimes I'm hearing on some of the House of Conscience here and there. And I'm like, man, they're still dealing with that old research. And if the white man doesn't, doesn't co-sign it, right, in his academic consensus, they deny it. Because they're not doing their own research. And because many of them lack the linguistic science, the linguistic, even of English, especially of English. A lot of the confusions in the black conscious communities. Because go over your GED again. Go over some of the basics, you know, understand etymology, you know, in context, in context. A lot of times people want to learn these things because they want to get a gotcha moment, gotcha. It's not about the gotcha moment, right? It's about the growing moment. Now, some of the different seasons of the Nile, but it's not everywhere in ancient Egypt, right? Or ancient Kemet, let's bring this out right here, that they harvested, but it was on the, the we say the right side. Now here is Kemet, here is Kemet right here, right, on a monument. They said, look, Kemet is on the monument right there. Well, of course, they're going to talk about their land and the agricultural land. See, talking about Kemet is like talking about the farmlands. Now, we know that all of America is not farmland. Don't we know that? We should know that, that all of America is not farmland. There are some lands that are the farmlands, and then there are other lands that are other lands. Same thing with ancient Mitzrayim. Um, keep it to the Hebrew, because the Hebrew is most accurate, right? It's, see, they're gonna they're gonna laugh it off because they're so-called white-led, right, and biased in many ways. You know, European-led scholarship, right, has generations of bias, right? Because 
many of these things that we even bring forward, there's only a few scholars among even the consensus scholars that have the linguistic tools to be able to decipher certain things. You know what I mean? Many of them have to hire out somebody else to, hey, can you interpret this so and so on? Yes, some of the Egyptian understanding of some of the glyphs they understand, but they don't understand that the same root words can be found either Hebraically wise, right? Or in ancient, ancient Amharic, the archaic Amharic or the Tigrinya, right? And heal up to, you know, I and I brother, you know, Legase Alen. Legase Alen. Legase Alen. Check out his writings. He deciphered a lot of things and it just shows that there are tools, right? Now, the results of other people's research is what it is, but we should be complementing these tools that we have, more better tools. So here, 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 let me prove to you that ancient Egypt, right? Ancient Egypt was not, right, called Kemet. Right? It was referred to as Kemet by the people of the land, especially the people who are, it's like people down south, people down south, down south people, right? There's people up north. The terrain, the ground is different in different places, right? Later on, we find that the reason why we so much on that Kemet, Kemet, is because they tried to whitewash ancient Egypt, Egypt. This is the reason why many of our scholars, the honest reason, the understandable, the logical reason. But some have gone to certain extremes, right, and are blocking out this knowledge, the real knowledge, and going to feel insulted when we say, well, ancient Egypt, right, was not called Kemet until the later dynasty. And even then, the rulers, go check out the rulers' cartouches. On the rulers' cartouches, they identify... Right, that they are the Neb, right, or the Lord of the two lands. The Lord of the two lands. We have that research as well. This is this is just some basics, right? It's some basics that we're touching on, brothers and sisters. So ancient Egypt, right? Let's get this right here. We might want to use this for we could break this down as well. Boom. So here, let's go to this very good page right here. This is one of our first um exhibits right here. This is a good article here on thought.com. What did the ancient Egyptians call Egypt, right? And as I was doing some research, first of all, I did some of my homework. And in doing my homework, actually, I got to recognize, well, where Egypt comes from, comes from the Het Kapata. Some say Haut Kapata. Haut Kapata, Ha Kapata, Egypta, Egypta, if you contract it. The home of the soul of Pata. And that was the city of Memphis. So actually, Memphis was the Het Ka Pata. You can see what's underlined right there. The home of the soul of Pata. Ha Ka Pata or Het Ka Pata. Right? The creator god, one of the creator gods of the ancient, you know, Egyptian belief system. Right? Their faith system. But as we scroll down right here, let's scroll down right here. Right? Um, so we have a lot of places that were renamed right here. Right? Were renamed. So the black soil of the land of the now but the black soil of the land of the now was not everywhere have you noticed whenever you're looking at the pyramids you look at the pyramids of the sphinx you don't see that black soil there have you noticed that that's just a proof point right there you don't see it right there right so the, why did they zoom in on the kemet well the kemet was that was that farmland was the farmland this is how they live this is how they survive so the duality dilemma right the duality dilemma Right, duality. Remember, it was the land, the two lands. This is what the ancient. Here we go, right here. We are there. Give me one moment just to bring this up, brothers and sisters. Here we go, right here. Here we go. The duality dilemma. Let's bring this out so you can read it. Let's read this together. The Egyptians, quote unquote, themselves, of course, adored the fertile black dirt brought up from the depths of the Nile. They they adored the land that I I, I kind of say like when the Ethiopians flushed all that you know, rich topsoil when the in the floods came down. It came from Ethiopia. Let's recognize that. That's what they all want to say. You know, it's all these articles and our so-called pro-black comedic scholars ain't doing us any justice. They might want to generalize Africa, but specifically, even in that time, it was known as Tobia and the Tob and the Kui, the Kush land. It coated the land along with along the river with minerals amidst the soil, which allowed them to grow crops. 
right, from that God land, Ethiopia. The, God, the people of Egypt, of Mitzrayim, called their country the two lands. But then in this article, the only thing I have uh, somewhat against this article right here is that even in this article, they did not give you the expression. And it's there on the monuments. Every, almost every ruler, we checked dozens, of, of, of more than dozens, well, dozens is several dozens, I would say dozens, right, of cartouches. And we find all of them referring to themselves as the Lord of the two lands, of the Sematawi or the Smaitawi. There you go. That's what it was called. Sematawi or Tau. Or Smai Tawi. Some not say Samai Tawi, Sema Tawi, Sema Tawi. The two lands, right? Monarchs frequently. That's one of the rulers and the Peraa. Pera. The what we call Pero. 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 Like we say Pharaoh, Pero, the great houses. You say, oh, they're not called Pharaoh. Yes, the great house is the Peraa. And in the Hebrew, we say that in the Afro Shemitic language, the Hebrew we say Paro. So, so what's your problem? But their problem is that their linguistic ignorance. Monarchs frequently use the phrase two lands when discussing the realms over which they ruled. I think ones have to look at this right here. How come we're not told that it's the two lands? But we're not told the expression that is found on their cartouches. Right? Can you show me any of the rulers that say that they are the neb of the Kemet? That did a neb. That was only the agricultural ground. Yes, agriculture and food is important for life and liberty. No doubt about it. And the people referred to it as the the Romet in Kemet or the Remet in Kemet. That they were the people of the Kemet. They were the people of that land, that soil, because of how important that ground that came forward from Ethiopia, from Tobia, from Kenya, from Zimbabwe, from Tanzania, from deep in the south, through that corridor known as the God Land. Did you know that Ethiopia was referred to as the God Land? They don't, they don't like to tell you this. Then the question would be, why don't you learn the Amharic, the Afro-Asiatic language? Why don't you learn this since even ancient Egypt is the Afro-Asiatic, Afro-Shemitic, let's put it like that, culture. Because they are caught up arguing the European, the white man's argument that they have in academia. And there's a lot of ancient Egyptian and even ancient Hebrew findings that are suppressed. I want to say that right here. There's a lot of findings that are suppressed. Why? Because if people found out exactly right, what they have really found out, could we say, you can't prove it, archaeology, there's some things that are being suppressed. And we know this from history, that they have made many claims, and then they find the archaeology later on. But we are saying to you that there's a lot. People say, well, why would the European Jews suppress this or others suppress this on their behalf? Because it points out the black side of the story. All right, just mark my words, because a lot of this is about to be revealed. A lot of these things, they already talking about they're finding new things. Some things they already knew they had. <laughs> it's that when people have this technology they can take a picture of it and so forth and so on you know what I mean and it gets out there so the monarchs right view their home as a duality right the ancient country the country of Mitzrayim was viewed as a duality Mitzrayim therefore the Hebrew terminology perfectly identifies that particular fact and that factor Right, and then we find out from an article such as this right here and other articles, our own research had proved this right to us, right? What were these two divisions? Right? The two Egypts. That's what was called the two Egypts, Mitzrayim. There was the upper, which is the southern, and the lower, the northern. Right? And the, in fact, the great houses, the Peraa, Pera, the Paro, right? The great houses, the Sutanet, the Sutanbet, the Nesubati, Mtubati, you know, they wore the double crown, which symbolically represented the unification of the upper and the lower Egypt, right? Or the Mitzvahs, right? By combining crowns from both regions into one big one. Right. And it says, or maybe the two sum reference, because some people say, is it because of upper and lower? That's one. But then it could be to the east and the west, the two banks of the river. Now, Mitzrayim was even sometimes known as the two banks 
because you had the, the bank on the east and the bank on the west. And the Kemet was on the east, east side. The west bank of the Nile was considered the land of the dead. And that's why you don't find around the pyramids or, or the Sphinx, none of that rich ground. So that means the whole land, the country couldn't be called Kemet. But the people, they love, they adore the Tameri, Tameri, Ta, land, Mary, beloved. That ground was beloved because of the food, it was life, right? But on the west side was the home to necropolises, the necropolises, necropolises, right? The galore, right? The living sun, after all, does set in the west where Ray. Ray, falsely known as Ra, -ah, right? But Ray symbolically dies each evening, only to be reborn in the east the following morning. In contrast, the silent and death of the West Bank, life was personified on the east bank where the cities were built, but it was still a part of it. They say perhaps it is related to the aforementioned Black Land Kemet, the trip of the trip of arable ground along the Nile and the barren deserts of what they refer to as the red land. This last option is what makes a lot of sense considering the Mitzrayim referred to themselves as the Remet in Kemet or the Romet in Kemet, the people of the Kemet, the people of the black ground. Kemet, note this right here. Here's what I like everyone to hit up your pro-black scholars, just to update. It can't. It doesn't mean you have to stop using that, but means you're gonna have to do the scholarship to really refer to it as what the rulers. Cause they also look at the pharaohs, look at the the, the great houses, look at the suta nesubati nesubati, all the great kings and rulers. But yet you're not referring to the land by what they referred to the land. You're saying Kemet, they did not refer to the land, the realm over which they ruled as Kemet because that was only part of their rulership, right? East side, west side, north and south, which is the perfect cross, get that? Kemet was first made, first made its appearance. Look at this. Kemet first made its appearance around the 11th dynasty around the same time as another term, ta Meri. Ta Meri did. Perhaps, as scholar Ogden uh, Golet suggests, these monikers, these names came out of a need to emphasize national unity after the chaos of the first intermediate period. To be feared, though, those words often appear in the Middle Kingdom literary texts, many of which were probably century edited centuries after the fact. This is what I didn't want to tell you. Many of the scrolls that they talk about earlier things are actually later copies. Earlier copies just don't exist. Many of which were probably edited centuries after the fact, so one cannot be sure how often these terms were used during the period of the Middle Kingdom itself. Because some would say, no, the Middle Kingdom. By the end of the Middle Kingdom, though, Kemet seems to have become the official name of Egypt. I want you to note that right there. The Middle Kingdom. Since Parao, since the pharaohs begin to use it in their titulary, in other words, in the realm in which they rule, but the origination it was Sematawi, Smaitawi, right? Sematawi, Smaitawi that brings out the same essential sense, right? As another ancient witness, right? The Hebrew Bible. I know some of you don't like that because you also are ignorant. You lack the linguistic, you know, the linguistic science, right, to really go into these things for yourself. And many of us, we lack that of ancient Egypt, but we're getting it. We're getting it because you challenge us, and therefore we have to bring it forward to you. So the Sema Tawi, Smai Tawi, brothers and sisters, right here, here, here. You already saw the podcast is beginning soon, 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 soon. Right, we'll leave the eye with a little bit of this right here on the outro. So the ancient land, right, full land, the double, the double mitzvahs, mitzrayim samatawi, right, around the Middle Kingdom or the Eleventh Dynasty period, we see where many of the rulers begin to include the Kemet. Right, the Kemet. So by identifying with the Kemet, seeing they thought it brought a more of a unity. Right, but still, even still, they still understood. Right, what the it's like home of the brave, uh, America the beautiful, 
and then you have the term United States of America. You do know the difference, right, between United States of America, right, and America. Now, if you don't, then we're going to have to pick up on that one. You know, we got to pick up on that one as we return to this particular reasonment. So what was the original name of ancient Egypt? It was Semitawi. It was Smaitawi. Only later on, right, did it become, you know, referenced, you know what I mean? Because it was the black land, the red land, it was the upper land, it was the lower land, only after the 11th dynasty. Only after the 11th dynasty. Let's just leave ones on this right here. So this also is another proof positive of the rightness and accuracy of the Hebrew scriptures. This is Wyndham. This is Brother Yadin, Ach Yadin, right here, Ras I Adonis, the far LOJ, the line of Jesus Society of His Majesty, LOJS.org. Also check us out, Rastafari Jews on the YouTube, as well as the live stream, Rastafari Israelites. Got to get ready, the podcast coming on just now, just now. A little bit more on this as we move forward. Shalom, Havarim. Shalom.